Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. You know, there's been a character trait that has been looming large, as they say, in my life for the past year or so, and that is that is patience, the value of patience, and I view it as a major theme of my life, and I want to talk about it with my friend today, Terry Hershey. And in, in the early days of COVID, when masking was new and mandates were just beginning, it was Terry who told me, Charles, you know how Terry talks, and he says, I'm, you know, I've heard it said with all this mandate stuff that... Um, Hell hath no fury like an inconvenienced American. <laughs> uh, I find it a hilarious comment because it is hilariously true. And it's all about, I think it's all about our inability to be patient with people, with our lives, with outcomes, with changes. So rather than explain all that, I think I want to get right into the conversation with Hirsch. So let's do it. Uh, Yo, Hirsch, good to have you back on the show. Charles, I I was writing that down because I don't ever remember what I say to you, so that was good. You don't remember that comment? You you, you don't remember where you... Yeah, I do do now, uh, and I was laughing when you read it because I said, that is so true. (laughs) That is 100% true. Isn't it? We are... Yeah... Okay, let's add this to it because I uh, here, here's here's part of the thing is one of the one of the uh, fuels for that sort of impatience is our addiction to sort of individualism. There's, a, there's like a a disconnect from community. So mm, that's an interesting observation. It is. It actually is a disconnect from from. What'd you call it? Community. Community. Connectedness yeah. of any. In other words, there was not a. If my first response is, is is not how are we going to process or go through this, but how does this affect me personally? I can see how there's going to be a lot of reactive sort of issues. Impatience would be to me reactive rather than responsive, but. Yeah, I think it, you know, and, and, and as I've thought about it, because I've, I've been thinking, thinking deeply about patience for about a year now, and, and it certainly is reactive, but it's also sort of um, embedded, you know, it's an embedded code within our genetic makeup, our American genetic makeup, that, um, that we are not patient people. We are, we are in a hurry to get what we want when we want it and like for instance for instance we were in Uganda and one of our guests that was traveling with us visiting Uganda uh, tried her hair dryer in a third world electric socket well fortunately she didn't blow up the hotel she just blew up her hair dryer but you know what was really nice Terry you know the typical American response would be, oh, my hair dryer, how can I go without my... And she just said, I'm in a third world country. Oh, well, what's the big deal? And and I admired that attitude, you know, over something as small as a hair dryer. But, you know, there are people that could be an issue. That could be a, that could be a serious issue. Mm-hmm. Not not having the right kind of hair dryer. But um, that is a... We call, them, we call them over there a first world problem. Uh, yeah. A lot of it has to do with, um, I, I don't know if you mentioned the word value early on in what you were saying, but it's about where we tether what we value. In other words, where do we park what we value? And, um, and a lot of, uh, sometimes we don't, we don't even stop to ask those kinds of questions. What really matters? And uh, what kind of questions matter in asking those things? Um, our, our first reaction is simply just, I mean, I get that. I see that all the time in travel, the first world problem stuff. Yeah, well, just travel, that's the, just in itself the inconvenience of travel nowadays, you know, that is. Yeah, but the whole point is that the, the, the anger comes from 
why am I supposed to be inconvenienced? <laughs> it's almost as if it's a personal attack. You know, if, they, if your luggage is lost, it's almost as if it's personal. Do you remember that? Oh, I got off a, a plane, because you know how it is when you're, you hear instantly people off the plane, they're on their phone, even before they're off the plane. And, and we were late, I don't know, 40 minutes, whatever. And the guy is saying on the phone, this is an effing, you ready for this? Disaster. This is an effing disaster. <laughs> um, <laughs> right away, you know, there's a little and, bit of... Uh, and so I'm, I'm, so I'm near him, and I said, wow, you mean like the Sudan? I mean, what kind of disaster are we talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we, but to your point is, it's become so internalized... We don't even think about the fact that we should just pause about that. Just wait, wait, wait a minute. Time out. Yeah, is it, you know, there's this combination of the influence of the ego that, like it or not, we we still continue to live like we're the most important person in the world. Um, and that... There are certain things in our culture that we expect to go our way. Is that, do you think that that has anything to do with, as much as I I, I don't look at myself as an entitled person, but that that is an entitled state to be thinking such a way as that? That everything has to go my way? Yeah. Well, entitled in the sense that if I see the world that way, I'm already determining what my way is supposed to look like. In other words, I'm already determining the way the world should act and respond to me. I'm already determining that. So the answer is, of course, that's entitled. You know, I have found, when I talk about patience, and when I talk to people about patience, they they quickly go to patience with people that we're impatient with, that we're impatient with their attitude, with the way they talk or act, or the way they respond. But, you know, patience is so much broader than just a response or a reaction from another person. There is patience in, in the work we do. You know, we're impatient about knowing for instance, our purpose in life, well, you know, maybe it's going to take 20 years or 30 years on this planet before you're going to figure out what your purpose is. That it takes a lot of experimentation and a lot of, a lot of value seeking and self-reflection. And we are not patient for those things. You know, we think that all of this is due us and... Well, there's a, yeah, and to me, the core for me, because of the, in terms of what I write about, because my response to someone like that is, I, don't, I need to know what my, my purpose is, and, and my, my question is, okay, and then what? I mean, okay, why? Because I don't really believe that's going to solve anything. We, we talked about, that was way back in the day, we talked about what God's will, I was a conservative Christian church thing, what God's will was. And you, so you couldn't really live your life until you found God's will. And oh, do you remember that? Do you remember the, 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 that, that book in the 80s? Um, there was a God's will book in the 80s. It was huge. Everybody was reading it. Yeah. And so, but then we also believed that once you found, quote, God's will, which basically had to do with uh, what kind of job you had and who you married, et cetera. Uh, but basically, once you got that, then what if you got what if it wasn't God's will? And you spent your entire life in an internal panic, which is what you're describing, the thing with, about, with the impatience. There's an internal panic because there's something yet to be that will make me something I am not now, that will resolve something I do not have now. There's the inability to be present, literally to be present. Who gives a crap whether the presence makes sense right now there's something there inside of us that I can allow to be at home here 
yes, move forward, whatever. But if I require something around the corner, always around the corner, always around the corner, there's no wonder impatience is the fuel. And and you know, do you know the irony is that the will of God they may not may very well is likely to wait. You know, you're saying, well, it wasn't the will of God. You know, somebody's saying, well, this obviously wasn't the will of God. Well, the way it's turning out is the will of God. And Well, yeah, because a person who says, obviously it wasn't, had to do with something going on inside of them. And in other words, we try to make sense of it all in terms of putting it in a certain specific box. That's why impatience is different. That's why patience is so hard. That's why if you... If you raise a child, if you have a grandchild, if you do anything, it doesn't fit in a box. And there are times when you just are face-to-face with something that doesn't make sense to you. But if you set aside the box that you have for this moment, you can be present there, and I'll be damned if you don't see some wonderful things. Mm, That's a good way to put it. I like that, because we have our, well, you know, we have our expectations in a box, and we need to set that box to a side and watch what happens in the world and see how that's impacted. I like that. Yes. So for me, my, my, I call it a paradigm shift. It's about asking different questions. The, um, the mother in the kitchen, her daughter's like three or something. She figures she's old enough to help mom. Mom's just exciting. She's going to help mom in the kitchen. They're going to make omelets. So, okay. Daughter in the kitchen, blah. So the, they're cracking eggs for omelets. Of course, the three-year-old's cracking eggs. Well, let's just say that the eggs she's cracking don't exactly go in the, in the bowl they're supposed to go into. You know, they're on the counter. Anyway, the mom is doing her best to sort of be uh, what you call a patient mom. Well, this is driving her back. She's thinking, this is crazy. This is nuts. Um and, you know, and her friend happens to be in, in the house. She calls her friend over. She says, I, I, what the hell should I do? <laughs> and the friend's advice was, well, uh, uh, yeah, you've got eggs on the counter, but you have a choice here. Your choice is you can either cook omelets in a neat kitchen or you can have a relationship with your daughter. There are nice. two different questions. Two radically and, and, and very important radically questions. different questions. Important In questions. other words, you have to decide which question you're going to ask to address what. And so a lot of the patience thing for me has to do with what question am I asking? In other words, what are my expectations about what this moment should be like? Which is why I see a lot of people. I've had to do that in terms of my own going back to travel. There have been times when I've just uh, sort of wanted to lose it with stuff that didn't go my way, and I realized, what kind of question am I asking here? So, let's get to where did it come from? We've kind of got that. But then what what are our options? What what do we, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about you as I was thinking about patients, and I was thinking about probably some of the most patient people in the world have to be gardeners. That 100% true. Can you give me any examples of how gardening has given you sort of a, a deeper reflection on the concept of patience? Well, um, it's interesting you mentioned the garden thing because I just, uh, I just about finished an absolutely terrific book called The Well-Garden Mind. And, and there are several chapters in there about gardening has been used in, in s- several um, places where there's uh, uh, prisons. And, um, and watching what gardening does to change both the spirit and almost the psychological makeup of the prisoner. Because for, the, for starters, gardening slows you down. It slows you down. Secondly, gardening gives you something to interact with that is not reactive to you. In other words, um, in personal relationships, sometimes we don't know what's going to happen, but there's something receptive about the natural world. And so you sort of, I mean, 
even though you want something to bloom or not bloom, you set aside your expectations so you're so grateful. So I had to go through that a little bit because when I first started the garden, I was so anxious about it, doing it the right way, <laughs> you know. It had I to know. I was, um, I was with you peeing around the perimeter of your yard so deers didn't eat your your your. Roses. Yeah, the, the deer the deer do not come through human urine. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a no. It's a boundary zone. That's true. Yeah, it's actually true. Yeah, gardening does two things when it slows you down. It makes you present. You know, you know. Go back to the woman with her daughter in the kitchen. First of all, when it slows you down, you pause. You're present. And when you're present, you focus in a different way. You're not necessarily looking at necessarily what's right or wrong. You're simply there. And when you see something, you can embrace things. You can learn from things. It's a different dynamic. I'm here. You know, little boy says to his mama, Mama, listen to me, but this time with your eyes. That's gardening. You know, it... it, it Oddly, it, it, it reminds me a little bit about, about when I'm coaching people. and Sport, this is perfect. Yeah, go for this, because this is perfect for sports. Oh, I, I was talking about executive coaching, but we could, we could make yeah. it apply to oh, sports. Oh, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's very easy to think that once you say something once, your coachee understands it and is going to... And is going to implement your suggestions or or um, guidance, but when you're talking about something like patience, you're talking about something about a lifetime a, a lifetime conglomeration of experiences that we are that we want things to happen and we expect things to happen and. Um, I think it's a very, I think it's a very um, um, cultural thing with us, and and I have found in coaching that I have to slow down and allow the person weeks or months to even get a concept because it's so paradigmatically changing that for them to get a, a concept that they need to they need to wait more. You know, I want to. Um, I, we're we're going to do a brief show today, and and I want to do I want to do a complete venue change. I want to change our playground, but I'm going to do that after a quick break. Hi there, you're listening to Charlie Hedges in the next chapter with Charlie, and I'm here with my good friend Terry Hershey, and we are talking about the superpower of patience, and that we are a very impatient society, that we, we don't like to be, we don't like to wait, we don't like to be forced to go out of our way, we want what we want now. Um, we despise waiting for a response or an action from someone else. You know, we email them. How come they haven't emailed me back in an hour? And, and if it's two days, you know, God forbid, or lost luggage, you know. You know what else I was thinking, Terry, as I was listening, things that we're impatient about? Um, listening. We're impatient listeners because we want our position known more than we want to grasp position of the other person um, but I want to I want to sw- I want to switch context and the, the context that I want to switch to is um, I want to go to a biblical concept and and I want to go I, I read this in a, in a little little journey kind of book that our inspirational book that I read and the author talked about the slow work of God. And, and as you read the Bible, you realize 
God is in no hurry. I mean, look at look at Israel. Israel when they when they went with Joseph and they went to Egypt from from Israel uh, from Judah they went to they went to Egypt and formed a giant nation. It was four hundred years that before God intervened. Intervened. So you you know you've got to be thinking this is this is a very patient a very patient God. And when we look at the New Testament promises that are in Jeremiah and, I mean, sorry, the New Covenant promises that are in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that speak of the Christ, those were going to happen, you know, a thousand years later. And that there is this slow work of God. And I think... I have this feeling, tell me what you think. You know, the the church is in decline with youth today. And I wonder if some of this and the impatience of our youth and, you know, our youth that are so so tech-savvy and so instant information, you want information, you can Google anything, get any information you want, have everything right at the tip of your hands. But... Faith traditions are not fast traditions. Faith traditions are slow work, and they they go through the doldrums, and they go through the difficult areas. Um, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have several. And, and it's not just young people who aren't going to church, though. It's... You know, lots of people are not going to church. Oh, that that is true. But it's you know, there, there's a there's a you know a, a bunch of young people that are not doing it. But it is everybody. Yeah. We're you know, church and is declining. You know, part of me, part of me doesn't blame them. With regard to the instantaneous, instantaneous uh, response, that I mean, we're wired that way. Our brain is wired that way. Social media has wired us that way. Our technology has wired us that way. Um, we are. We, there's no such thing as... Let, let me interrupt and just ask, do you think that's American, or do you think that's worldwide? It's technology. Okay. Okay. Good. It's the systems we have. Technological systems do that to us. Now, I don't know enough about some other cultures. I know one thing that is American is that we don't put our phones down. We don't leave it somewhere when we have dinner. <laughs> I know. So there's, so there's something about that 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 in and of itself means we're not really there. We're not focused. Um, you know, I was I was talking. I had I had a woman on the show. Um, um, I can't remember how long ago, maybe a month ago, and she said with her international travel, the one thing that she looked at that Americans are always in a hurry. I mean, you know. Always. You, you think of when you go to a restaurant in Europe. If you don't ask for your bill, you're going to be there till you're going to be sitting there till closing time. Correct. That table is yours until you close. You know, I've told the story on the show before where I was at a, um, I was sitting on a terrace writing my journals and uh, drinking sparkling water and espresso. And I felt really guilty because there was a long line of people wanting to get into that, into the, into the area where I was at, and so I was feeling guilty for not buying and you know keeping the, the servers busy and tipped up, which they don't tip that much in in Europe anyway. And so I went to the hostess, and I just said, "Can I just give twenty dollars, you know, just to, you know, kind of own my table for a little while?" And she looked at me and she said. Don't be silly. The, the table is yours until we close. One, once you're given that table, that is your table. So don't even worry about it. And that's a, you know, I, I'm thinking even in my favorite restaurants, they're still giving me a bill before I finish with my dinner. Yeah, actually, that's, yeah, I'm still taking bites when they bring it to me. That would be true. So you were asking me something before. It had to do with God. God and something God in history or what? No, God, the slow work of God. Oh, yeah. You know what, though? It's, here's what's interesting. is This just has to do with asking the right question. If I see the slow work of God, in other words, I'm 
wandering the desert, for example. In other words, if I see the slow work of God as why can't God get us where God wants us to be kind of thing, I'm still missing the point that even the see, as long as arrival is the only thing that makes sense for us theologically, we will never be there. Never. It's not about arrival. I love that. You know, as much as we talk about the journey motif, it's so easy to forget about the journey motif and that we think about arrival, yeah, about the, getting the, there. That's why I'm I'm a huge fan of the of the, seven, the priest of the 1700s who coined the phrase "the sacrament of the present moment." I mean, that, I mean, even even in the Jews wandering in the desert, I mean, the the, the manna, even the manna thing, they they, they you know, they, that freaked them out too. They so they hoarded it. In other words, the sacrament of even that. We, we forget the sacraments of what's going on even... So the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly, and of course I'm going to make a statement about climate too. The monarch butterfly is almost is an endangered species now. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, of course. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got to say I remember in the 60s when we just had thousands of them around my house. Yeah, so the monarch butterfly... Uh, uh, does this big trip journey every year from uh, Canada um, you know uh, places you knew in Canada northern Alberta they in, and then British Columbia uh, they go from there down through California into southern Mexico and this is their uh, but, but monarch butterflies and I'm not going to get this part right they only live a few weeks they don't live for years. Did you know that? I did not know that. So this is, I mean, this I, is what's I, interesting. The monarch butterfly, when they do that, what's that called? That journey? Metamorphosis. That journey they do, yeah. <laughs> Metamorphosis. Um, From cocoon. The, the ones that leave Canada are not the ones that arrive in Mexico. And it's not the second generation either. It's the third generation. The point is, they're all part of the journey, even though two of the generations never made it to where they were, quote, supposed to be. But they were part of the process of getting there. They were all, yes, exactly. And so as soon as you have to name that a, the arrival is the only thing that matters, we've missed everything. Yeah, there's something else going on. Migration. I, the word came to me. Yeah. Yeah, the something, something else is going on. That's that's in the moment. Um, I have an example I want to use. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Bible to you in um, Matthew chapter 11. Um, John the Baptist is in prison, and he's seeing the things that Jesus does, and he's beginning to question: Was he right about Jesus? Is Jesus the Messiah? So he sends his disciples, and this is my interpretation of the conversation, um, is that John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the expected one, or should we expect another? Because John likely was was looking at some sort of political relief, and that Jesus was going, you know, the Messiah was going to take us out of the rule of the Romans and get us into the rule of God. And Jesus quoted Isaiah and said the blind see and and the deaf talk and the lame are healed. Um, and the gospel is a, and the gospel is proclaimed to the poor, which is interesting. But um, Jesus in essence talked to John and said, John, I am the expected one. I just did not come the expected way. And I think that's what we're facing today in the church. I think that there's so many people, so many young people have been taught this prosperity gospel and this God who answers all our prayers. All we have to do is pray and we're going to be the next greatest and the next latest and greatest. And that is not God's expected way. God's expected way is developing love and and patience and kindness and compassion and those things are going on constantly. They're always said, but we're not looking for them. Well, those are not the expected the way. Yeah, now we're back to the mom in the kitchen. 
Do you want a tidy kitchen or do you want relationships? How do we explain to people that God is not the genie, is not the one who's going to just take whatever troubles I'm working, I'm going through today, and dismiss those. Now, sometimes, but oftentimes God does not. How do you explain that to people? I don't. Well, I mean, no. That's just... Um, I yeah. like that. I mean, you know, whether you reframe it in terms of God being love or God being sanctuary and safety, um, the point is that in that kind of relationship, the invitation is for me to be at home in my own skin. Literally wholehearted and at home in my own skin. So the first thing for, for that shift to happen to me in terms of my theology is I had to give up being it, believing in a creedal God, which means I had to let down a lot of the boxes I had for what God was supposed to be and what God was supposed to do. And and assume I I, I love that, but what do you assume you, when, when you when you let go of something? What do you take on? I take on I take on the invitation. If, if grace is real, I take on the invitation of the sacrament of the present moment, that it's okay to be alive and well and here and now. And if I'm alive and well and here and now, so are you and so, so are the people that are in the circle that I'm around and the community I live in. So that means the connection there makes more sense than where, we're, than where I'm supposed to be. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking of the not expected way. I'm, I'm hung up on this not expected way thing. And that a lot of times we're expecting very tangible, uh, I'm going to get this job, I'm going to get this house, I'm going to get this wife, I'm going to get healed from this disease. All of these, rather than the character and the internal compositional changes that are happening every day regularly and you can you can count them and actually if you created some I'm sure you could probably weigh them and measure them if you wanted but but there is there is something so much else going on in our expectations and our patience with the activity of the divine in our life Yes. And, and you're, it sounds like you're waiting for an and. No, I'm waiting, yeah, I'm waiting for an and. <laughs> <laughs> and. And, and, and I, I don't have an and. It puts um, us both in a quandary. Yeah. One of the, the things that I started to learn and in... In, you know, you know, back in the days when I went to the St. Andrews, the Benedictine Monastery, because, you know, I wasn't really good at that kind of sitting and or praying and or whatevering, right? Um, and to get on with it. And uh, just resting and sitting was not easy. And learning those moments, see, now I'm back to gardening. Gardening did that for me, finally. It wasn't a theological class, it was gardening. You know, I'm, I'm in my garden. Um, I may be weeding, I may be planting, I may be whatevering, but it's not about where I'm gonna get to. You know why? Because tomorrow there'll be a lot more to do. So it's, it does, it's not about finishing something. But all of a sudden, an hour in, and you're thinking, and you, your breathing slows, um, you, you, you're, uh, you, all of your, um, you can you can see and hear things that you weren't before. You're you're very present, and um, so you're a, you're awake. You're attentive, and in a good way. As a human, that means I would 
then if, if, if I take that same thing into relationships or with people, then I'm awake and attentive to, to people around me, too. That would be that would be the carryover. Yeah, I like those two words: awake and attentive. I think that's um, uh, and, and attentive to the circumstances, not to my personal needs. If I'm an awake and, and, uh, and attentive yes, yes, to my yes, personal yes, needs, yes. then I'm I'm going to miss a lot of what's going on out there. Yeah, and and. I mean, if you're only attending to your personal needs, obviously there's some something going on, right? That's back to the entitlement expectation. Yeah. Now we're back to your very first introduction, yes. So, oh, oh guru teacher, what... What I, I I'm going to ask you something that I know you're very uncomfortable with. What are steps? What are actions? What are what are things we can do? First of all, is to is to make a, a lot of it is conscious choice. It's like Viktor Frankl say, you know, we can't control the outcomes of life, but we can control our attitude about it. And what we're talking about is in patience, and with patience, we are talking about controlling our attitude. And controlling and controlling our expectations. Mm-hmm. And my, uh, it, it's a series of questions that I would ask anyone. So uh, you come to me with any number of those things, and my questions are this: Tell me where you can sit still. I don't care for ten minutes. I don't care for five minutes. How about two? Tell me where you can sit still. Tell me where you can breathe. Tell me where you can pause. Tell me what you saw this week that did your heart good, that made you glad, that made you stop what you were doing so you could be glad in the moment. Tell me what allowed you to hit that emotional pause button. Now, what does it take to pay attention to those things? See, for me, it's about giving myself the permission. It's not about adding something to my life. It's something that's already there. It's about giving myself the permission. Yeah, and I think and I think people people can tend to think because it is it it's easy to think that you know time to slow down and 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 think, reflect, contemplate is taking valuable productivity time away from me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Plus, plus, while you're pausing, you're thinking, "Am I doing this right?" Oh gosh, think about you know. I've been meditating now for four years, and I still, yes. I still meditate with the monkey mind. My mind is all over the damn where. You know, I'm not going to pretend to say I'm in some, some yeah, zen I mean, state. That you know, well, you know that old story, don't you? They, um, the. This is centuries ago, the young monk doing his meditation, prayers, goes to the whatever the head monk is and says, uh, I suck at this. I'm, I think I'm uh, impaired. I use that language, yeah. I, I, I don't know how to do this. It's obvious. What do you mean you don't know how to do this? Because you, obviously when you're doing this meditation prayer thing with God, I'm supposed to be in the presence of God, but I, where I sit, there's just... There's flies everywhere. It's just awful and all. I mean, the entire one hour of my prayer is flies. So obviously, what have I done wrong? What do I need to learn? Etc. <laughs> See, we're back to the questions we ask. And the the senior monk said, laughed, of course, and said, and and so you're spending the whole time shooing the flies away? Yes. Because you don't believe the flies need God too. In other words, why is that? Yeah, it's an inconvenience. Of course, it's an. In- now we're back to the impatience thing. Inconvenience, yes. Does that mean that we can't be present? We can still be present. Yes, we can laugh. Yes, it's not fun. But this is where I am. Do you remember three years ago when we were doing, or three thirty years ago? when we were doing um, singles events, and I believe we were in Florida. 
I believe it was in Florida, and we had a guest speaker. I believe her name was Susan Muto. Do you remember her? She was from Duquesne. Oh wow! And she was a she was a a mystic at the time, and we had no idea what mysticism was at the time. And wow. she baffled most everybody, and there was a handful of us that really sort of globbed on to what she said. And she was talking about dining in Spain and with all the flies. And she said, you come to a point where you have to make a decision. You're either going to spend your time batting away the flies and not enjoying your meal or just forgiving the flies, forgetting the flies, letting them have their way and just eat your meal. That's great. But just That's really great. But just let, you know, ignore them. Let them go. And and I think that has so much to do with with our unexpected way our ex, you know that that God comes in unexpected ways, life comes in unexpected unexpected ways and the more we are open to accept our lot um, the happier we're going to be yes and I so if someone comes to me with an issue with impatience uh, I tell them the goal is not for you to become patient the goal is for you to be grateful in now and that'll take care of the patience problem Grateful as you, I think. I think it's required that you ponder. You know, you ponder those sacred moments. That you can't be grateful w- without pondering those moments. That there are good moments in there. Well, you can't be grateful unless you stop. You got to stop. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Somebody wrote a book called Pause that talks about oh, that. Oh man, you, you should you should use that as an advertisement for your. <laughs> Okay, man. This was kind of a rambling discussion. Uh, the the, the guests though. don't know that 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 I had a I had another guest scheduled for today who backed out at the last minute, and you so graciously accepted filling in. I, I you know I really appreciate that. Thank you, Terry. That's very Always kind good, for you to do that at the last minute. Always good. And it was good. We saw each other last week, and it was good to see each other in yeah, Palos Verdes. Good. Was, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I got to attend part of your seminar. Yeah. And I learned all about all right. portals and yeah. into your sacred space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. It's, yep, it was very good. Okay, my friend, I will talk at you. All right, thanks, Charles. Thanks, Hirsch. Well, that's all for today, everybody. This is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.